It's absolutely remarkable the effect I have on people. You <laughs> all shut up. <laughs> well, anyway, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor this evening to introduce our speaker. He has been a speaker at Oak Hill several times before. Uh, Paul Jewell uh, was both a teacher and a counselor at public schools in Iowa and also schools in Switzerland. He has written a number of books about, for the most part, about Iowa history. And tonight he's going to talk to us about Grant Wood Abandoned Plans. Please give an open all welcome to Paul Jewell. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lauren. I appreciate it. And I'm glad to be back at Oak Knoll and, and see all of your faces tonight, too. Some of you I know personally, and others I would hope maybe had been here before when I uh, made a, a, another presentation. I hope you can all hear me. If you can't, just let me know. I have a pretty strong voice, so uh, I, I hope that'll work. You know, the Iowa painter, Grant Wood, created numerous works of art uh, during his lifetime, and perhaps he reached the pinnacle of success with his masterpiece, American Gothic, in 1930. And according to some polls, uh, this particular painting of a man and his daughter has become one of the most recognizable paintings in the world, arguably maybe with Mona Lisa and also uh, Edward Munch's The Scream has also been part of that. Uh, there's never been any doubt with people close to Grant Wood uh, that he had numerous projects ahead of him. And he may have even been approaching the height of his career uh, just before uh, his last illness. But Grant's death in, 19, in February of 1942, just short of his 51st birthday, took away all of his plans and all of his promise. The University of Iowa President uh, Virgil Hancher at a memorial for Grant Wood said the following. He said, he is still a young man at the height of his powers and there was reason to believe that he was on the threshold of great creativeness. It is difficult therefore to measure the loss which his early death has caused. Well, with the death of any person, famous or not so famous, dreams, plans, and ideas quickly come to an end. With an artist, the admirers are left to wonder just what might have been created for the generations yet to come, uh, for them to follow and enjoy and treasure. Uh, we'll never completely know what Grant Wood wanted to accomplish, but we can look at a few of the ideas that re remained just that, uh, unfinished. By the fall of 1938, and by the way, these are going to be segments today, they're not in a chronological order, but by the fall of 1938, Sarah Maxson Wood and Grant Wood had separated. Their marriage was a short marriage, as many of you know, and eventually, Sarah moved to the West Coast, the state of Washington. Uh, there was a need for a live-in housekeeper, and a young Mennonite woman, uh, at that time living in Henry County, uh, south of Iowa City, she applied for the job. Her name was Mindell Wagler, and at that time, Mindell was 20 years of age and a recent high school graduate. Uh, she was looking for a housekeeping position. And Mindell had heard down in um, the Mount Pleasant area that housekeepers in Iowa City were being paid a lot more money uh, than those in her own small town. So she was very eager to secure a position here. She interviewed for the job and she quickly accepted it. And she was to stay in the employ of uh, Grant Wood um, for a, a couple of years. Um, and Mindell, I interviewed her, and she remembered so many things from that time period from 1938 to 1941. 
Uh, it was during those years that Grant did much of his painting there in his home at 1142 East Court Street here in town. And Mendel really worried, uh, really remembered that he was working on Parson Weems' fable at that time and was intrigued as he painted the, the cherry tree. It was also during these years that she was in his employ uh, that, she, that he co created the colored lithographs that he had. Um, uh, uh, the uh, flowers, uh, tame flowers, wildflowers, fruits, and vegetables. Um, but Grant was also known to have used friends as models for some of his paintings. So it's not surprising at all that Grant also asked Mendel to pose for one of his drawings. Now he told her that the piece would be called The Family Saying Grace, and that no one would ever recognize her. Uh, he completed this preliminary sketch on brown wrapping paper and included, as you can see, four other characters. The drawing was to feature three generations of a family, and Mendel, of course, would be the center of the drawing, portraying the wife and the mother figure. Grant had her sit in a window in his studio and pose, uh, wearing a family brooch and also an apron. And a young boy and his sister, that you can see are part of the drawing, and, and for this, Grant used two of the children of a family friend and neighbor, Dr. George Stoddard, uh, who was a dean of the University Graduate School as models. Art Stoddard was about eight at this time, and his younger sister, Ellie, uh, was about six. Now, it's unknown who Grant had in mind for models of the other two characters, the father and the grandfather, but he told Mendel that the finished work would be made into a lithograph, which he was doing at that time in which uh, it was a very inexpensive way to get a wonderful work by a famous uh, artist, and usually they made about 250 of these. But Grant thought the market for this one particularly would be limitless, and he could foresee uh, this lithograph hanging in the dining room of uh, Iowans and, and Americans across the way. Um, but, for some reason, Grant put this particular lithograph on hold. He didn't finish it. And Mendel watched as he sketched more paintings and often worked on several at a time, but it was never completed. Well, after Grant's death, a portion of the drawing was published in the November 1942 issue of Ladies Home Journal. It showed only Mendel and Art Stoddard. Well, remember what I said about Grant assuring her no one would know her. As soon as the issue came out, a neighbor brought it over to Mendel's house and immediately said, I recognized you right away. A poem titled Grace accompanied uh, the colored drawing. Now, no one is sure how the magazine got the image, <clears throat> but my guess would be that it probably was lent by his sister, Nan Wood Graham. Well, that print that you just saw, the preliminary drawing, the family saying grace, it's now in the hands of the Figgy Art Museum in, in Davenport, having been purchased by them from Nan Wood Graham in 1965. Well, get this, Mendel remains a good friend of mine. Mendel is 102 years old, and just recently moved out of her ranch home uh, into a facility, um, an assisted living facility in Mount Pleasant. I just got a two-page handwritten letter from her the other day. Uh, so she's a, a really amazing person and a charming person. Now one thing that um, always bothered Mendel a little bit, she was a widow when I met her with five children, and, of course, she had spoken with her family about this experience in her life many, many times uh, to her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. Um, but that's all she could do was tell the story. She didn't have that bit of evidence that um, would have solidified that. Well, I was at the Figgy. This is all now online, but at that time it wasn't. And I was going through Nan Wood Graham's scrapbooks and I came across uh, this photo. Well, Mendel was thrilled because it shows her with Grant Wood, with Nan Wood, and this is Park Reinert, 
uh, a, a Grant's secretary, and here comes Mindell uh, serving the meal. So she was very, very pleased with that. My next vignette here, um, well, this of course is 1142, um, where uh, she was employed. Uh, this is a wonderful story in itself, and uh, I was here once at Oak Hill when Jim Hayes talked about his house and the uh, various things that uh, Grant had done in, in the building. But the next vignette I'm going to be talking about here is something called The Wolf and the Lamb. Uh, and this was a grouping of pencil and ink on paper drawings that uh, is also resides at the Figgy Art Museum in Davenport. Now there's some mystery surrounding these Grant Wood pieces uh, and they were completed in the late uh, 30s, maybe even into the early 40s. But the speculation uh, surrounds the patriotism that many Americans, of course, began to feel as the United States inched towards World War II. Uh, uh, Grant did not record what the drawings were to represent, but he did supply some clues. Now, it's important to step back into the time period to try to determine just what he might have been thinking. Uh, Grant did have some history with patriotism. He had served in World War I. He did a mural for the Harrison School in Cedar Rapids uh, called Democracy Leading the World on to Victory. And of course he's done, and I'm sure many of you have seen the magnificent uh, memorial window for the Veterans Memorial Building in Cedar Rapids. So Grant probably had some pretty strong feelings when in 1938 uh, the British Prime Minister, uh, Neville Chamberlain signed the Munich Agreement, uh, conceding the Sudetenland region of uh, Czechoslovakia to Nazi Germany. The war was certainly on the minds of many Americans throughout 1939 and the early years of 1940, when Grant created the series of drawings. Uh, on one of the drawing pads, he had sketched a bushy-eyed um, fellow uh, and face, and he called it Chamberlain. Another sketch showed a snarling wolf and a weak kneed lamb. So one could speculate, of course, that the wolf may have represented Adolf Hitler and Chamberlain the lamb, but they were not identified as such. Another partial sketch shows a lion and a fox. And under one of the drawings, Wood had handwritten one of Aesop's fables concerning these two animals. Of course, these are ancient fables that uh, date to the 6th century BC, and they were intended to teach a lesson to young children. Just under the sketch, uh, Grant tells the tale of the wolf and the lamb, and this is it, I'll read it for you tonight. Once upon a time, a, a wolf was lapping at a spring. When looking up, he saw a lamb just beginning to drink. There is my supper, thought the wolf, if I can only find some excuse to seize it. Then he called out to the lamb, How dare you muddle the water from which I am drinking? Nay, master, nay, said the lamb. If the water be muddy up there, I cannot be the cause of it, for the spring runs down from you to me. What then, said the wolf, why do you call me bad names this time last year? Well, that cannot be, said the lamb. I am only six months old. I don't care, snarled the wolf. If, you, if it was not you, it was your father. And as such, he rushed upon the poor lamb and ate him up. And just before the lamb died, he gasped, any excuse to serve a tyrant. Well, Grant did do some work for the war. This is uh, based on some of the things Grant said in a 1941 interview. He seemed uh, strong in his belief that artists need to find their place in this awakening of America. And as the entire nation looked on with much apprehension of what was taking place in Europe and the Far East in those days, months, and years, uh, Grant did speak out on his concerns. His major artistic contribution was this poster that he completed for a group called Bundles for Britain Incorporated, whose purpose was to send American clothing and medical supplies to England. And this image, of course, shows a mother shielding her child from Nazi bomber planes. Grant's approval 
to do this poster certainly indicated his international concerns at this time. Now, interestingly enough, I did a little research to find out who the models were. And of course, many times models are not identified, but in this case, they were. Um, Grant had a, an art student uh, whose name was uh, James, the last name was James, and this is his wife. Uh, Catherine James was her name, and her son, uh, Howard Jr., um, is, she's protecting. And later, Howard Jr. Um, became the Midwest Bureau Chief for the Christian Science Monitor. So lives do go on, don't they? The next vignette talks about uh, what we call the Old Zimmerlin Church. Um, well, Grant, during the time he was married, really enjoyed driving out from Iowa City uh, into the eastern Iowa countryside and observing the works of both man and nature. Uh, after marrying Sarah, and they made the move here to Iowa City in 1935, pleasant Sunday drives were kind of part of their routine. Uh, they'd load up his old Ford car with a sketch pad and camera and set out to explore the highways and the byways. Now on one such trip, after a conversation with a colleague, um, Grant set out he made it a point to seek out a deserted church building that had been described to him. And as expected, the brick church, which was located just north of the small town of Morris up in Graham Township, eight, about eight miles northeast of Iowa City, that had immediate appeal to Grant. Although it had been deserted for many years, uh, Grant's eyes saw its significance and he thought it to be an architectural gem. It had been built by Pioneer Methodists in 1874, and he later discovered that the formal name of the church was St. John's Methodist Episcopal Church, but locals all called it the Old Zimmerman Church. Now, Grant was aware of talk around campus about the need for a chapel at the University of Iowa. Uh, perhaps they thought in connection with the Iowa Memorial Union. Well, Grant then brought the deserted church to the attention of the university's architect, George L. Horner. Initially, it was thought that the old Zimmerman church might be moved to Iowa City, but after inspecting the structure, st stability and strength uh, of that really bygone building, it was decided that that option would really be impossible. So then the idea was presented that perhaps an exact replica could be built. Well, Grant liked this idea and continued with his personal interest in the project. He also had a place in mind, and his place in mind, see if you follow me on this one, was somewhere just west of the new arts, fine arts campus on the west side of the Iowa River. Now, this, he thought, was a place of natural beauty, he thought, and it would complement the history of the structure. My thinking is it's where Art Building 2 is now, right on the old quarry. He would have liked to have had that church uh, right next to it. I, I don't have any verification of that or documentation. It's just my thought on it. Um, so Grant made sketches, and he took measurements of the roof line, windows, and the steeple. And in early 1938, uh, Grant spoke with officials at the university about constructing the chapel on university property. He also shared a dream with them, and get this, the dream was that he would paint 40 murals on the walls of the chapel. Um, the art would, according to Grant, depict the history of religions in Iowa. Two students built a model of it, and various financial considerations were made to move the project forward. But by 1939, the project had stalled. Grant felt that the building itself needed to be erected first in order for him to be able to visualize the walls necessary for the possible murals. He hoped the structure would be completed in time for the centennial of the University of Iowa in 1947. Well, university administrators felt the murals should be finished first and didn't believe there would be any help from legislative funding from Des Moines in the near future. 
Grant again stated that he expected to make this the outstanding mural contribution of his life. He also told them that it would take him at least 10 years to complete the 40 murals. He said he felt the little brick chapel would capture the very uniqueness that was religion in Iowa. But at the end of the university's physical year in 1939, the whole idea was placed on hold and formally postponed uh, for five years. Of course, Grant Wood would never see five years, would he? Uh, this was also a rough time for Grant with uh, problems in the fine arts department that you probably know about and also his divorce from Sarah Maxson Wood was finalized in September of 1939 and no one knew that Grant just had a few years to live at the time. Well, the old Zimmerlin Church was torn down in late 1941, just months before actually Grant's passing and the piece of fertile Iowa soil on which it had stood for decades was turned back into cropland. But the university didn't give up on the idea of a chapel and received funds in the early 1950s from the Danforth Foundation in St. Louis. The chapel would be based on the model from Grant and the same dimensions as the original church structure. But it would now be located on the east side of the river in an open green space just south of the Memorial Union building now called, of course, Hub Hub Hubbard Field. And the building, this is construction of that chapel, uh, it was dedicated in January 1953. The, in, the total cost was $30,000, and this particular building can hold 75 people. And it's been used, as some of you know, maybe in fact someone um, might have had children or been married or who knows what in this very building. Uh, it's been used for many weddings, and it's loved by both uh, students and faculty. But no one, none of us can imagine what that would have been like with 40 uh, murals uh, by Grant Wood. But that was not to be. The murals he had envisioned would never be seen. But of course, here is, is the chapel building, looking a lot like the old Zimmer, Zimmerman uh, chap, uh, church, isn't it? Well, the next vignette is going to involve this man, and of course this is uh, Francis Merville Wood, um, and that's Grant's father. Uh, he had married Grant's mother, Hattie, in 1886, and this union had produced four children, Grant being the second born. Um, interestingly enough, of those four children, none of them had children, so there was no uh, generations uh, going on from there. Well, Grant was just 10 years old when his father suddenly died in March 1901, and so the memories of him were really limited to a very young age. Um, well, Grant entered University of Iowa Hospitals on November 24, 1941, and he would remain there a patient for the rest of his life. An operation was done on December 19th, and if you think about that, we're thinking about Pearl Harbor had occurred. He would have been in University Hospitals when he got the news of Pearl Harbor. But on the 19th, uh, an operation was performed and he was told that he had advanced cancer and that his life would now be measured in months instead of years. But the doctors were not totally sure just how long Grant would live. Uh, he seemed to find some strength in the knowledge that he might still be able to do some painting. He told a visitor, I want to go back to my studio. I've still got a lot of pictures I want to paint. Well, the hope of leaving the hospital didn't last for long, and after some anxious times in the early mornings, Grant realized that he needed to remain in the hospital. He did try to uh, maintain a degree of normalcy in his life, and he thought he might be able to do some painting in the hospital, and possibly he did. I found another reference that uh, his doctor at the hospital at the time was named Hans Ehrenhaft, and he said, uh, he made the statement years later, he said, well, uh, Grant Wood kept drawing and painting and doing all sorts of things, and that he was very accepting of his fate. Well, he did tell uh, his longtime friend Marvin Cohn that he wanted to paint right here in the hospital, and one of the things he told Marvin was that during the first weeks in the hospital, the idea had come to him that he might paint a picture of his father. 
Um, he felt that although he was only 10 years old when his father died, he could remember him very well. And he had this old daguerreotype or, or tintype uh, of, of his father that he could use. Uh, he kind of planned it to be a companion piece uh, with that of his mother. Um, he had done one of Patty, or of Hattie called Woman with Plants. And some speculated that Grant may have felt this could be sold by his sister Nan for some income after his death. But Grant's health continued to fail and it became apparent, apparent that he was no longer going to be able to paint. Grant hadn't mentioned to anyone what might have been represented in a painting of his father. If he did have something in mind, uh, he was too ill to share it with anyone. The next vignette uh, is a bathtub. Now this is not a Grant Wood painting, uh, but it's something to think about as we talk about the next one because there was no painting made. But let me tell you a little bit about the background on something that he was calling the bath, 1880. Grant thought he had come up with a wonderful idea, a great idea in the latter weeks of December in 1934. He even had a name for the new proposed painting. He was going to call it the bath, 1880. And in the Daily Iowan of December 15th, uh, 1934, Grant wrote, I have in mind a picture that I'm going to do. I'm going to do it in a very serious vein, regardless of how people take it. The picture, he went on to explain, must be very authentic. The main part of the painting would be an old gentleman wearing only red flannel underwear who would be standing next to a round wooden tub. In the background would hang blue checked aprons. The man would be pouring steaming water into the tub from a kettle. It would be his Saturday night bath, and the man would be looking rather grim. At that time, of course in the 1880s, people only took baths maybe once a week, and in the winter, since there was a chance of catching cold and developing pneumonia uh, and dying, they probably took them even, uh, there was probably more seldom in taking a bath. Well, Grant was really looking forward to uh, being able to use the color red for his underwear. Uh, he said, oh, for years I've envied the old Flemish painters because they were able to use such brilliant, lovely red in their paintings of men. Modern costume does not permit that, and the artist is limited in his color range by the somber dress of his models. But Grant had trouble finding a suit of underwear that he liked to use. Uh, with the Cedar Rapids man that he had chosen to use as his model. Grant was always extremely interested in details and he had a problem with the underwear. You see, he said, the question arose on whether the red flannels of that period had knitted wrists or pull-up strings. And there was no way to settle that except to get a suit of red underwear. He wanted some that was well-worn and might be a little baggy. Um, his first search in Cedar Rapids turned up nothing. No one seemed to want to admit that they had even used such a clothing item. A grant asked at various stores in town and even contacted a costume company in Chicago that he had previous, previously worked with. And during later 1934, he even advertised in classified uh, ads in newspapers in Minnesota, Illinois, and Iowa for a very authentic suit. Well, finally, some underwear was found in Minneapolis, and there was a report that a sketch had been made and would be finished by the end of 1935. But the bath 1880 was never painted. Critics of Grant, some probably jealous of his success, began to say that the advertisements he had placed were too much like publicity seeking and that they felt was unseemly for an artist. Nan in her book, My Brother Grant Wood said, that made Grant so mad he refused to do the painting. And ever after that, whenever red flannel underwear was mentioned, his face would become flushed. He was so angry. It would have been the most famous painting because of the publicity given by the newspapers, but he would never speak about the painting again, she said. That was the one time I actually saw Grant downright angry. 
In fact, the most unusual thing about him to me was his continual good humor. He rarely showed angry anger, and he took quite a bit to get him riled up. Well, just two months after this controversy and the publicity surrounding the painting, a grant married Sarah Sherman Maxson, who I've mentioned, in Minneapolis. But rather than identifying the groom in this, this ad as a painter of American Gothic or Young Corn or Stone City, the editor chose to headline the marriage announcements with the words, Red Flannel Artist is Wed. Throughout Iowa and the rest of the nation, the controversy over this never completed painting was certainly still on people's minds. But Nan uh, contended that, uh, that they might have been wrong because you see, Grant did use long underwear in one of his lithographs uh, in 1939. Art historian Jane Malash wrote in her work titled Grant Wood Studio, she said the long underwear ended up in a lithograph Midnight Alarm, depicting a man holding a kerosene lamp to light his way down a staircase. The next vignette is the self-portrait of Grant. This was the original work. Um, when he died, he had left an unfinished oil, a self-portrait taken from a sketch that he had made a decade earlier. In early 1932, the Iowa Federation of Women's Clubs asked a group of Iowa artists to submit self-portraits in a statewide competition. And the sketch that Grant submitted showed him wearing overalls and a light-colored shirt, his typical work outfit. And he also included a windmill and some rolling Iowa countryside as a background. Now, Grant was really pleased when his self-portrait was voted the most popular in the competition. Well, during the next years, Grant took his sketch and created a nearly identical painting in oil. He altered the part of the painting that showed his outfit, deciding that the overall straps detracted from the portrait. He added an open colored shirt and featured other elements in the background. This partially completed painting was to stay in Grant's studio for the next 10 years until the end of his life. How often he worked on it and why he never finished it is unknown, but he was evidently never quite satisfied with the outcome. He did keep the windmill in the background. He once said, the old masters all had their trademarks and mine will be the windmill. Whenever it is feasible to use it, I will. Well, this is then that second portrait but interestingly enough, after Grant had died, his sister Nan asked old friend Marvin Cohn about this unfinished self-portrait and quizzed him concerning what he thought Grant might have wanted to do to complete the project. Marvin Cohn wasn't quite sure, but he did take on the project and he did some work on this, Marvin Cohn did. In a letter, November 21, 1950, he wrote to Nan, after completion of the work, and he said, I have repainted only the little somewhat triangular, triangular shape on either side of the neck, following very carefully the lines originally used by Grant and also the colors. These could be seen despite his scratching out of the area. And the little haystacks on the left I introduced because in the first painting or underpainting of which David Turner had a photograph, they appear. I'm pleased with the result and I hope it meets your approval. I'm always glad to help you in whatever way I can and perhaps I am helping out Grant too. Cordially, Marvin Cohn. Now the next image is certainly not a painting again by Grant Wood, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about Nebraska. Um, there were two important projects in the state of Nebraska that Grant showed interest in pursuing. The first was a possible mural for the Nebraska State Capitol building in Lincoln. It became known the Nebraska government was looking for someone who could depict the natural and social history of Nebraska's Native American and pioneer cultures. And several prominent Iowans, including the governor, wrote letters of support of having Grant Wood do this mural. And Grant had already worked at the Hotel Chieftain in, in uh, Council Bluffs. Uh, he 
some of his paintings were at the Jocelyn uh, in Omaha, his painting of Stone City. Uh, the University of Nebraska had his painting, Arnold Comes of Age. Uh, but in the end, the commission didn't go with Grant, nor did they go with some others that were mentioned at that time, in, including Thomas Hart Benton and uh, N.C. Wyeth. Um, they were also in the running. But instead, Heldreth Meyer, Meyer was hired for a portion of the project. Um, the other Nebraska possi possibility was with the Omaha Playhouse. Uh, Grant's maternal uncle, Frank Weaver, his mother's brother, was a longtime lawyer in the city of Omaha, being a partner in one of the oldest firms in the city, Weaver and Giller. In fact, an item appeared in the Cedar Rapids Gazette that stated, Grant Wood paints scenes of Brigham Young play in Omaha. It went on to say, Grant Wood of this city, nationally known native artist, is painting scenes for the first dramatic version of the life and loves of Brigham Young, the famous Mormon, who will have, which will have a world premiere in Omaha on April 3rd, 1931. But to me, at least this seemed a little premature. I called down to the people at the Playhouse and to see if they had any records of any of this or if any parts of what Grant might have painted remained, because one would have thought at that point they would have understood the importance of him as a painter. Um, they believed that Grant might have given some ideas to the people painting the murals, but didn't do any of the actual painting. Uh, this, is, this was too bad because the Playhouse was very active at that time. A young, lanky, and then unknown young man named Henry Fonda was involved in many leads in the plays there at that time, and a high school student named Dorothy McGuire uh, had also was involved. And added to this was a Mrs. Brando, along with her daughters, was one of the best leading women of the time, and her son, Marlon Brando, tagged along as just a young boy watching his mother and siblings perform. Well, the show did go on. Uh, Brigham Young premiered in Omaha during the summer of 1933 and later went on to New York. Well, again, here we see nothing, no works by Grant Wood, but a couple of more interesting stories. Uh, during the summer of 1941, um, when Grant Wood was in Clear Lake, Iowa, the last summer of his life, he put the finishing touches on the last, his last major royal paintings. One was called Spring in Town, and one was called Spring in the Country. They were companion pieces in this case. Not only were the titles similar, but they portrayed a similar rural and small town theme. This was not the first time that Grant had envisioned companion pieces. In two of his more famous works, he created only one of the pair, announcing but never finishing the other, maybe never even starting the other. Uh, Des Moines, uh, this was a, a piece out of the Muscatine Journal and News Tribune of January 19, 1939, stated uh, that Grant had shared some of his ideas for a new allegorical series of paintings. It says, the newspaper uh, is written, Grant Wood, Iowa artist, believes George Washington pictures need a bit more realism and says he's going to set an example. Now on a lecture tour, Wood said that when he gets back to Iowa City in February, he's going to start putting on at least two historical stories on canvas. One will be of George Washington, which of course he completed, and the other will be of Pocahontas, the Indian maid who saved Captain John Smith in early colonial days, asserting that a large number of old American tales that have almost become myths are gradually being dropped from the public consciousness and the school textbooks. The artist said of his forthcoming works, George is going to be a real little six-year-old kid and he's got to be smug. The Washington painting, of course, came to fruition, but the Pocahontas painting never did. Why did Grant choose to do the first painting concerning the fable about George Washington? Well, one biographer felt that Grant's interest may have stemmed from a family heirloom. Grant's great-grandmother on the wood side of his family was a woman named 
Hannah Hollingsworth. The family had passed down a brown glass flask that would nicely fit into a pocket and inscribed on the artifacts were the words, this pocket flask belonged to Colonel Hollingsworth of Virginia and was carried by him during the Revolutionary War. Well, he was on George Washington's staff and said George Washington had drunk from the flask several times. So Grant had probably taken at least some pride in this connection. The other companion piece that was never done relates to Grant's most famous work, American Gothic. Created in 1930, Grant used, of course, a dentist and his sister as models, and a house in Eldon, Iowa as a backdrop. I know you're familiar with this painting, but at that same time Grant uh, exhibited in Chicago, he announced in a letter to the Des Moines Register on December 28, 1930, that he did have a compa companion piece in mind. Grant wrote the following. He said, it's my intention later to do a mission bungalow painting as a companion piece with mission bungalow type standing in front of it. The accent then, of course, would have been on horizontal rather than the vertical. But again, this painting never seemed to be mentioned again. Uh, this man's name is Bruce Mahan, Mahan, I think. Uh, with some of these, I've never heard them pronounced, so I'm, I'm hopeful that's correct. Uh, museums of art throughout the world certainly take special interest in their local artists. And time and money are spent in trying to bring home works of art by people who were born in the area or lived in that area for periods of time. It's usually impossible to obtain all of an artist's work, so the quest is never totally finished. But as time goes on, the process of building a collection for a museum continues. And for many years, the University of Iowa had none of Grant Wood's major paintings. It wasn't until December 1984 that the university obtained their first major painting by Grant Wood titled Plaid Sweater. But there have been, there have been attempts made by alumni and faculty members shortly after Grant's death to secure some paintings of his own for the university. About two months after Grant's unexpected illness and sub subsequent death, President Virgil Hancher suggested to Bruce Mahan, director of alumni services, that he write a letter to Fred Lewis of Harland, Iowa, who was the chairman of the 1934 Senior Memorial Committee. The letter contained the class's unexpended class gift fund. It had been a common practice for graduating classes to put together funds for use as a memorial to their class. And that 1934 class had $1,012.95 that they originally proposed to be used in revamping the lighting system in the Iowa Memorial Union's lounge. But Mr. Mahan then suggested that the class of 1934 might team with the class of 1942, that the gift might be used to purchase the first in a series of paintings for an art collection to become part of the permanent collection at the Iowa Memorial Union. The first to respond after sending letters out concerning this proposal was a, a young woman named Manda Zuber. And she wrote back from the nurses' quarters at Letterman General Hospital in San Francisco on April 14, 1942. Of course, so many of the young people were involved in the war effort at that time. She may have been the first to suggest that the classes purchase a Grant Wood painting. Others quickly joined in, in both the combination of gifts and also the Grant Wood piece seemed very appropriate. And, and so the search began. Uh, the committee first turned to Dubuque, and they asked the head librarian at the Dubuque Public Library if they would consider selling Victorian survival. But the Dubuque Library Board, minutes of June 12, 1942, explained their answer to the request. This is what was read. A letter was then read from Mr. Earl Harper of the University of Iowa to interviewed board members concerning the purchase of the Victorian survival if deemed advisable. The librarian having replied that this would not be necessary and the consensus of opinion of the board members present being against its sale. 
no further action was taken. Well, then they thought, we'll turn to Cedar Rapids to see if we can't get one of their paintings. So a letter was sent to Jenny Post, who was a principal at Wilson uh, High School in Cedar Rapids. And Harper asked whether the school district would be interested in selling young corn. Well, uh, Jenny Post immediately responded that young corn was a memorial, and of course it cannot be sold. It had been a memorial to one of their teachers, uh, Lenny Shulman. Well, three months later, a third attempt was made. And this time, it went to Paul Grumman, the director of the Joslin Memorial in Omaha. Harper now asked about Stone City, initially offering a total amount of $2,300 for it. No other funds were available at the time, and using tax revenues for this purpose was not to be considered. But then President Hancher said that he would personally add $200 to the amount, making it $2,500. And Harper then used another technique in trying to convince the Joslin to sell Stone City. This is what he wrote. I realize that this means that a considerable amount would be invested in you, by you in goodwill and in helping with the laudable project of placing a Grant Wood picture at the university where he was sponsored and where he taught. But Grumman didn't fall for this approach. Instead, he responded by stating that his committee uh, is unalterable, unalterably opposed to the sale of the painting. He continued, the local association would resent it if they disposed of the painting that they had the foresight to buy uh, before Mr. Wood really attained recognition. How the funds were allotted eventually is not known, but with the World War raging, the issue seemed to have been dropped. And here is uh, that one major painting, of course, from the university. Now, I put in two pictures here. The one on the left that you're seeing on the left, uh, that was before the restoration. And this restoration took place uh, when Plaid Sweater went to the Whitney um, for an exhibition, and probably the Blumberg family um, probably had this above their fireplace. So over the years, uh, it had taken on so much dust and dirt. And see that the difference between the two is rather amazing, isn't it? Um, and another uh, short vignette here on the autobiography, this was another uh, abandoned plan. Uh, early in 1933, Grant be befriended Park Reiner, whose picture you saw earlier, a young man living near uh, Wood's Turner Alley studio and home in Cedar Rapids. And, uh, Grant quickly noticed that Park Reiner's abilities in both the spoken and written word, and so he asked him to become his personal secretary. And sometime later, Doubleday Duran Company offered Grant a contract to write his autobiography. And Grant believed that with Park's help, this might just be a possibility. Park capably took over the task, and Grant seemed to tell the stories, and Park had the way of putting those stories all into wonderful written words, if you've ever read this. Uh, they did the first five chapters, which was about 192 pages, and it took the reader up from the time in which the family, uh, up to the time in which the family left their Anamosa uh, area farm and moved to Cedar Rapids when Grant was 10 years old. Park later used this same work uh, as his uh, master's degree thesis. And Grant created a cover for the book, although it was never finished, that he called Return from Bohemia. Um, the, the two men often said it was almost done, it was almost done, but it never was done. And it doesn't appear as if, if they worked on any part uh, further than the first 92 pages 192 pages, uh, no one uh, knows where they are. Uh, of course, Park married after this. He had a family. He worked for Democratic uh, senators and congressmen the rest of his life, passing away in uh, 2000. Well, this also is not Grant Wood, but in the months prior to entering the University of Iowa hospitals for surgery, Grant was looking into a commission for the American Tobacco Company, and he made a trip down to North Carolina. Lucky Strike, 
which was one of their leading cigarettes, best-selling cigarettes of the time, and it was also sponsored sponsor of a very popular um, radio show, Hit Parade, had long used pretty girls to sell their product. But now their advertising department was looking into using some paintings by American artists in various magazines to show how tobacco was actually grown. Grant told his friend Park Reiner that he had two swell ideas for those paintings. Other artists that Grant knew uh, the American Tobacco Company was talking to included uh, John Curry and Thomas Hart Benton, Paul Sample, and, and others. Well, quite unfortunately, as you know, Grant knew far too much about the habit of smoking. Uh, in an age when most men did smoke, and some felt it was even good for one's health, uh, Grant had become a two-pack-a-day smoker. And it hadn't been easy, but by Christmas of 1940, he was telling people he was concerned about his health, and he had succeeded in kicking the habit. Whether he did or not, I'm not sure. Uh, this came just a year before the enticing offer from the American Tobacco Company. Well, Grant's health, of course, prevented him from anything except some anticipation regarding the project. The other artists were signed, <coughs> excuse me, were signed, however, and as early as March 1942, ads for Lucky Strike using an artist's work began to appear in such magazines as Life, Saturday Evening, and the Saturday Evening Coast. And by ne November of that same year, however, the American Tobacco Company decided to change their advertising approach once again. They would now base their appeal on the world war that was raging in both Europe and the Pacific and use the slogan, Lucky Strike Green Goes to War, and changed their packaging from green to red and white. In this ad you're now viewing, the advertisement was done by artist Peter Hurd, and it appeared in Life magazine. One can only wonder then what ideas a Grant would have had in mind. Well, upon Grant Wood's death, a small sketchbook was found that belonged to Grant that showed, among other drawings, a signpost of some kind with both ears of corn and the words Cedar Rapids. And also the right image was found in uh, Jim Hayes' home at 1142 East Court. Uh, nothing more is known uh, concerning what project Grant had in mind. And in one of the final photographs showing him as a teacher, a newly appointed professor of fine art, Grant Wood, is shown talking with a student at the beginning of the fall semester in 1941. Just a few months later, he would enter the hospital. Um, Dorothy McRae, the wife of Grant's friend and teaching colleague at the University of Iowa, said in a 2005 email to Leah Rosen DeLong, author of When Tillage Begin, Other Arts Follow, uh, Mrs. McRae wrote, the work that Park Reiner destroyed at Grant's request while he was in the hospital consisted of a series of pastel plain art drawings that he had done during the last year, which were a departure from his traditional work. I thought they were quite lovely, but he insisted they be torn up in his presence. Well, I haven't told you everything, of course, tonight about uh, some of the ideas. Uh, I know, for instance, that he had some plans for some additional murals uh, in the Iowa State Library. Um, but I've told you enough of them to, I hope, pique your interest in, in all of that. And I give thanks here um, also. Uh, that actually is Grant Wood's own easel, and that's at the Piggy uh, in Davenport. And some thanks for uh, various people that I borrowed images from. And that concludes my uh, talk tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh. And we do have time. If somebody has a question, I can't guarantee I can answer it, but I will try. So my recollection is that the relatively recent uh, Grant Wood exhibit at the Whitney Museum mentioned and indeed some respects emphasize the role and importance of commercial commissions in some of Grant Wood's work. Could you comment on that?
Well, I'm sure it did. I saw that. I went to New York to see the Whitney exhibit. Um, in terms of uh, his lithographs, certainly, uh, there at the end of his life were commercial. Uh, and the talk of uh, doing the series on tobacco uh, would have fit in that category, too. Um, I think he was a man, I mean, 51 years old, you just think of that, and um, so young. So I'm sure he had a lot of ideas of things that he could do. It, does that answer it? Does yes. that yes. answer the question? And I'm supposed to repeat the questions too, and I forgot that. I'm sorry. Yes? Is it not true that, that Grant Wood did a lot of mural painting, and in some cases they were even painted over? Uh, I think Cedar Rapids is one example, uh, like a municipal building. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, they were asking about murals. Uh, he was asking about murals, other murals that Grant had done. Um, the ones at Iowa State, of course, are outstanding that uh, he was in charge of. Um, the ones in Cedar Rapids were not done by Grant Wood, um, although they sh probably should have been, but there was some disagreements going on there, too. Um, interestingly enough, I had the opportunity, and maybe some of you have also, of touring the, the fine arts building that was uh, swamped in 2008. There is a mural on the wall there in the bottom part of it um, that uh, they've kind of tried to clean up. Unfortunately, it's on the plaster. And I don't know how much preservation can be done. It isn't a Grant Wood mural. Um, Joni Kinsey has done some research on this, and she seems to know who uh, might be the artist with that. But in terms of other murals, um, I just would have loved to have seen the ones he might have used for that uh, Danforth Chapel, that's for sure. I wish I could have been more clear on that, but that's, that's kind of what I know. Yes? Do you want to comment on his murals in the post offices of Iowa? Uh, he has none. Uh, Grant Wood has none. But there were a lot of regional artists, certainly, that had those commissions um, with the Public Works uh, Administration. Um, but as far as I know, Grant never did a, a post office mural. Um, I think he was scheduled to perhaps do something out in Washington, D.C., but that uh, never materialized. I, th I think I'm right on that. We're, again, we were talking about murals. Well, you've been a good audience, and I thank you very much. I know time goes by here, and, uh, and everybody's probably ready to, to end their evening. So thank you. Thank you.